Hey Maggie, do you want to tell us what you saw as a serving police officer when it was around the grooming time and you wouldn't turn of uh, gang listen to us here? I saw as a serving police officer just went against everything that I promised to do. When I joined the police, I was a 41 year old woman, so I was not a typical recruit anyway. You know, I'd got four children of my own, um, I'd been a chair of governors. Um, at my kids' school, um, heavily involved with, with children. And for me, one of the most, imp if not the most important role for a police officer and social services is protection, is to protect vulnerable kids, kids who actually can't protect themselves. So I first became aware of grooming in 2004 and five, mm -hmm. and I, I, there, won't, there isn't really enough time to go into everything. People should read my book. Yeah, definitely uh, read the book or um, read it off the uh, Kindle. Well, you know, um, I, if you've listened to it, you know that I read that book. Never done it before. But many of the kids that um, I've supported actually don't read very well. And um, also, I feel that it, 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 it can give more impact to some of the things that I'm saying. It to be accessible to survivors who often have missed lots of school. Um, and picking up a book is very difficult. So I, I just wanted it to be, um, and I wanted to read it myself because the publishers put forward a, an actress to read it um, and sent through it and it just was not right. So I thought, you know, I was a bit nervous of doing it because I've never done anything like it. And it took me three days to actually read it. Um, but I'm really glad that I've done it. I, you know, I can only say so much in any interview where I wrote my book because any interview I do, I try and make it relevant, but there is so much more than just a half an hour conversation lane. But so I, I became aware of grooming um, and the sexual abuse of, of very vulnerable children who were mainly in care in 2004 and five, and they were being approached, groomed and sexually abused by gangs of Pakistani men. GMP, Greater Manchester Police, knew about it, as did social services. Um, and I spent probably a year and a half on that job. And I went off work to nurse my husband who was terminally ill. Yeah. The job at that point was a big job. It was being run by the major incident team. We had a whole team of detectives. We had over 200 men that we suspected were uh, more than suspected. We knew um, were grooming and abusing kids. Yeah. I came back to work three months after Norman died and that job had been buried. Not one man had been prosecuted for the rapes, for the abuse. We had social workers like banging on our doors saying they'd been trying for years to get the police to listen. Yeah. So it, there was no doubt that this was going on and I couldn't understand why they had buried the job. But to put it into perspective, you know, I, I had been off that job for three months I didn't have any documentary evidence to back up what I was saying um, there was a gap in my knowledge my husband had just died I'd got four kids at home I tried to get answers and I couldn't get any and despite trying I had to you know I had to accept that the job had been closed down but it never left me so you know it never went away because I knew what had been going on and it didn't just stop because GMP were no longer running that investigation so you know wind forward to 2010 and I was approached um, and asked to go on this job in Rochdale in Operation Spam and um, as the people who have watched the drama will see that scene where I you know I'm, a, I'm asked to go on and I say you know thanks very much but no thanks I am not going down that road again and I was given cast iron assurances and documents to say there would not be a repeat of what had happened previously. This was a really big job. Um, there were some children that were considered to be right at the centre of this uh, operation. The abuse was no longer going on. It had finished, um, but we knew what had happened. We knew who the offenders were. We knew who the victims were. And eventually I agreed to join the job. And what I saw, initially it was really being run really well. Um, and I brought some kids on board who spent months telling me personally, on behalf of GMP, what had happened to them. We had a fetus in, in the property that had been seized unlawfully from one of the kids when she was just 13. Um, I had to get permission. I, first of all, I had to tell the family that we had it. You had to build up um, trust with them uh, kids because they didn't know you, did they? You build up trust. and. You know, I was 
seeing all these kids on, on a daily basis, um, giving them assurances on behalf of the big bosses. I wasn't um, dealing with a job of my own. I was acting on behalf of GMP. So seven months later, after these kids have put their whole lives on hold, their trust in me, spent months um, giving video interviews, taking me around locations where the abuse had happened, um, going to ID parades and picking out the men who had raped them. Then to just be told on a Friday afternoon, sorry, we've changed our mind. No, I, no, you don't change your mind. And no, I will not accept that. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But at, at, right at the start, I actually thought it was one officer who was just lazy. That's how naive I was because it did not make any sense to me. Um, and I struggled for 18 months to be heard as a, as a police officer saying, what is going on here? You know, you're not recording these rapes. You're not prosecuting all the men. Um, I, I didn't believe that any senior officers knew what was going on. Um, but I was loyal to colleagues and I struggled initially to speak out because I didn't want to cause colleagues a problem, you know, individually. It's that uh, whistleblowing uh, technique, isn't it? Uh, a lot of people don't like uh, whistleblowing because they're scared of losing their jobs, they're just scared of losing their livelihood. You know, I've got one, one colleague in particular who I felt was a, not a bad person, but way out of the depth, uh, really didn't know what they were doing but I felt would cause them a really serious problem if I spoke out. But I had a con and I've, I've talked about it in the book, I had a conversation with that person after a couple of months where they basically said to me that they agreed with everything that I was saying. They had a history of child protection, a background of child protection, mm -hmm. um, agreed with what I was saying, but said to me, basically, you are just a detective. You, in your rank, you do as you're told, and if you can't do that, you know, senior officers make decisions, you do as you're told, and if you can't do that, maybe you're in the wrong job. And that was as though a light bulb had gone on in my head, and I thought, I have to speak out. I cannot allow another 10 years to go by where kids are being failed to speak, then I'm as bad as them, and the abuse of those kids then lies on my conscience. And I've got four kids of my own. And at that point, all the Hillsborough stuff was going on. And families had lost 30 years of their lives trying to be heard and get to the truth. And I didn't want my kids to turn the TV on in 30 years' time when I'm dead and see all this scandal about Rochdale and think, well, my mum was on that. Why did she not? So really, I decided that I was going to speak out um, but I didn't, at that point, believe that the chief constable knew what was going on, that the head of serious crime, that the Home Office, the Children's Commissioner, I didn't believe that any of them knew the situation. I thought it was one officer, really. And as I went and, you know, I, it, was, it was like a roller coaster. I, I first spoke to the head of the Public Protection Unit, and she basically gave me all the reassurances. She'd seen it before. She would stand up for what I was saying. She told me the old boys network was alive and kicking and it was a struggle, but you know, I should trust her. And then a month later, I've heard nothing. Then I went to the chief constable who basically said, thank you for your interest. If we can learn lessons, then we'll learn them. You know, thank you very much on your bike. And I, that's how it, it was. And then I'd go into the depths of despair again. I think, where am I going to go now? You know, I was trying to work. And it came to a head when I actually just collapsed at work. Um, I was so ill, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't make sense of it. Um, my colleagues, I was back on my own team, the doctor who signed me off, and I never went back to work. Um, and I made the decision that I would go public. But I was threatened whilst I was in the job and, and basically told this was secret, I must not speak about it, it was confidential, data protection. But I went, once I uh, resigned, I went to some of the kids and they gave me their permission to talk about, not name them, talk about what had happened. I had their complete support. And armed with that, I, I sat you know, with my own kids and said, 
because I, I really did believe I would be arrested. I didn't know whether they would try and prosecute me, but I did know that I could back up every single thing that I was saying. And it was just a decision that I, it was, it was the worst time of my life. You know, I, I lost, I'd lost my husband, but I couldn't have saved him. I'd lost my little granddaughter. Nobody could have saved her. But if I didn't say something about these kids, then I was allowing more generations to have their lives destroyed. So it was a very heavy burden. You know, it really was a, a really, really tough two years. And with what's happened since, it, it, it might not seem as so though it was that bad because obviously I worked on the drama for four years and everybody now knows what's happened. But that's because I lived through those days and decided that speaking the truth and standing up for kids who didn't have a voice was was so important and if i didn't do it who else was going to what hurts me uh, the most is that the kids wasn't recognized as kids and it's all about that whistleblowing uh, aspect and the police didn't basically didn't want to know it is a scandal it, it is to me, it is gross criminal neglect. And lots of pieces of the puzzle have fallen into place since then. One of which was that in 2008, um, and I didn't know this until two years ago, because Nazir Afsal, who was the Crown Prosecutor, I don't believe the CPS um, charged the men with, with the right offences, with adequate offences. They were charged with you know, trafficking. They, they were out of prison within two or three years abused generations of kids, raped them. It was a cop, a cop out. Those men should have been charged with rape. And if it was my son who had raped a 12 year old child and got her pregnant and we had a fetus and we knew who the father was, that's a rape to me. Never mind that she had special needs and was vulnerable and was on the child protection register. So I'm still, it still makes me rage that, you know, they can still pretend it was a fantastic job because it wasn't a fantastic job. But um, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. It's fascinating uh, what you're saying, Maggie, because these kids was written off, wasn't they? And you're giving them that voice to actually be open and basically tell the story of how the police and that um, let them down and how the services let them down. And the only person that was technically believing them was you. You were saying about, you know, you're... you're you're giving a voice to different people to speak. These kids were being written off because they, they was, it was said they were making a lifestyle choice. They're not making a lifestyle choice. A 13-year-old cannot choose to have sex with 20 men in one room. You know, pardon me, like pissed out the head. You know, that is not a choice. And that is why police and social services are there to protect them. And they were not doing that. And however much i look at it from whichever angle that is gross neglect of duty you know accountability not one senior police officer has been held to account peter far was the chief constable at the time when i wrote to him back in 2011 and begged to go and see him face to face he wouldn't see me he was knighted he resigned uh, he retired with a big pension you know he should be in prison, as far as I'm concerned, for failing generations of kids. And he's not alone. But the establishment gets together and protects these people. You know, I'm doing lots of things behind the scenes, trying to bring accountability into the law, because police are unaccountable. You know, they all... But, but these, you know, these are just such massive failures that have destroyed thousands of lives throughout the country what what i was just going to say was that i didn't realize until 2000 and uh probably about two years ago because nazir Russell, who was the crown prosecutor at the time who i believe didn't charge the men with adequate offenses he made public a couple of years ago that in 2008 the home office sent a circular to every police force in the country saying that they must not um, investigate the grooming trials because the kids were making the lifestyle choice. Now, for me, that and, and now the Home Office are trying to backpedal and say, oh, no, we didn't do that. Well, yes, you did. This was official policy. And in this country, it is illegal for a 50-year-old man to have sex with a 13-year-old child. And th these are just basic human these are just it's basic human um, decency. But the laws of this country say that is illegal. And, you know, I've made it very clear that 
the vast majority of the grooming gangs are made up of Pakistani men. They're not Chinese and they're not Japanese and they're not from Thailand. There is an odd one that's not a Pakistani man. Um, but, but I'm not racist in any way. I'm just saying that the law is there to prosecute paedophiles. You don't not prosecute them because of where they come from. We promise to do. I mean, in my book, my, my book, I can't remember the exact wording, which is why I'm just looking. But in my book, I start the book off um, with the oath of attestation. You know, where is it? I should know it. <laughs> you know, you swear that you will act with fairness, integrity, diligence and impartiality. Every chief constable promises to do that. That's what I promised to do. I didn't promise to be selective about who I thought we would, we would charge and who we wouldn't, based on factors that, you know, if we can prove somebody is a paedophile, as far as I'm concerned, we charge them, jury, to decide. So, that, you know, and I will do my best to discharge all the duties faithfully according to the law. And however many times this went round and round in my head in the middle of the night, that's what I came back to. At really simple things um, and so when I hear that you know politicians are getting involved in policing the CPS are choosing not to, to, to charge certain men they're not charging with the offences of which they're guilty I, I just couldn't not speak out well you're responsible for your own actions are you? these things are not easy they're, they're really really not easy and I would have done anything not to be put in that position mm -hmm. I loved my job I really you know it was my life I was, a, you know, not only was I a detective, I was a family liaison officer. I worked on a lot of the biggest jobs that GMP um, had. You know, work, I, I worked on the really serious cases. I was, it was mainly murders and I didn't really work on child protection. But my skills, um, my like natural skills really, meant that I was really good with vulnerable people. People trusted me because I am honest. I, you know, I, I wouldn't mislead people. Um, so when this job came up, they headhunted me for this job. I didn't work in Rochdale. I was on the major incident team. This was being run by the Public Protection Unit. So out of everybody in GMP, they approached me to go on that job. Well, you know, they picked on the wrong one because if you give commitments, you carry them through, particularly when it's about children who are being failed. I couldn't, if it was a robbery or a burglary, yeah, it's not nice, but it's not life changing and it, it, it was as simple as that and I you know so what I've learned since 2012 though and sort of I wish I hadn't learned what I've learned I, you know and that is I swear that that's the truth I wish I could put all this back in the box and go back to my trusting naive former self but I can't yeah. because what I've seen has led me to believe that and um, there is no care out there for, for survivors of abuse that the system is disjointed it very much depends on who you actually deal with um, it's not consistent um, survivors and victims are often fobbed off you know the authorities talk the talk but many of these people are powerless and I'm inundated every day with messages on Twitter on Instagram desperate you know, desperate messages. I can't help everybody personally who contacts me. I wish I could. There are not enough hours in the day. So what I want to do is, is put my learning into my foundation. And no, you know, I don't trust anybody really. So I, I wouldn't join forces with any other charity because I don't know what they stand for really. I know what I think should be happening. So the only person who's really going to do that is me. So I've got two trustees now. You know, the, the Maggie Oliver Foundation now is established. It's a legal um, entity. We haven't got the charity number yet, but the, you know, all the, what they call the um, steps, you know, the, D, yeah. the, the, um, the steps have been done. The paperwork is in what we're waiting for the charity number. Um, I've got two really good trustees. One, a lady called Diana Porter, who set up Fresh Start New Beginnings, a, a fantastic charity in Ipswich, but they deal with younger children, really. Yeah. Um, and another, um, another girl who's a, a good business person who's helping with all the paperwork, trying to establish firm foundations 
Um, and then hopefully by early next year, we'll have a, a pilot, which will be initially probably just a drop-in centre. But I, I want it to be somewhere that, that, that victims or survivors or feel safe, that they feel they can go. And, and I don't just mean survivors of the grooming gangs. I want this to be inclusive. So when I say I'm not um, race, racist or prejudiced, I'm not. I've dealt with, a, with quite a few jobs where there were you know, young Pakistani girls who had been forced into marriages that had nowhere to turn because within their community they would be ostracized and, you know, really thrown to the walls if they spoke out. I want them to feel they can come in. Um, th there's quite a big Somalian community and so they have nowhere to turn. So mm -hmm. I want it to be a safe place where, you know, lots of these kids, I mean, you deal with like younger children, but these are usually young women usually young women who That's come nice. and maybe have somebody there who's been through it before them. So a mentor or a friend, but as they grow in confidence, they then become more able to talk about it. And I would be linked to a, you know, psychotherapist, counselors, full advice, um, maybe just a, a listening ear or other girls who have been through what they've been through. But, you know, we will find the person or the organization or where they need to go for help. So it's going to be, um, you know, a, like a create an environment where they feel safe. And I hope that everything that I've said, I, I hope that people trust me and, and that's what will bring them in. But finding the right building is going to be very difficult because I don't want them to feel that they're going to be um, identified as coming into the Maggie Oliver Centre. So all these things are what are preoccupying my thoughts right now. So maybe I will, I haven't yet, but I'm thinking possibly approach one of the colleges in Rochdale because the first one has to be in or around Rochdale, but I would like this to spread out. I'm, I'm very aware. I mean, I, I've had, I've actually had nothing negative at all in all the, apart from one story where somebody tried to say that I'd made a, a career out of this. Well, yes, I have written my book, um, and yes, I'm always, but I'm not, you know, um, all the, most, most of what I've done, the, the vast majority of what I've done, I have done for nothing. Yeah, I went on Celebrity Big Brother, and yes, they did pay me, but I have to pay my own bills. Yeah. You know, I have to earn a living, but I went on there to try to um, raise the profile. You know, in order to be heard, you have got to be out there. Yeah, you've got to keep your face in the public arena. You know, I I do understand what um, what survivors have gone through, and I do know how the criminal justice system is failing them and continues to. So I'm trying to use my voice to highlight what I see as the um, as the failures in our system, and that isn't that's based on my experience and what I've learned. So the only way to expose that is to talk about it right. and to do that I've got to keep on you know boring myself with some of the same <laughs> things that I keep saying but I'm doing it because there is so there is such a long long way to go yeah. um, and isolation is one of the key problems that that you know I've become a bit of a magnet for as you say for people to write but the the similarities in, in all the different stories that I get show me that, that there's no joined up system. If all those people, no, there, there isn't. And, you know, it's divide and separate, which, you know, when I was a police officer, you'd go to a domestic and that is what you'd do. You'd split up the, 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 the you know, the fighting pair because you know that once you separate them, it, you know, you, you've, you, you're in control then. Um, I think that's why Hillsborough was successful because all those families came together. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is pull together all these experts and all these people who have got knowledge and experience and le learned lessons. I want them to have a, a place to go because I believe that if we all pull together, we will force through the changes that we need. A bit like the blind leading the blind. I don't really have a, a, an absolute set pathway you know, it's it's all it's all evolving. Yeah. Um, but I, I listen to my gut. I listen to what people are saying, and I'm trying my very best to 
create something that will help more than the number of girls or victims that I can help myself. And it's the only way I can think of doing it. Uh, but obviously I'm going to need funding. I can't, I can't do it without. But I think once we get a pilot centre, then I'm, we definitely will need somebody who knows about fundraising and applying for you know, lottery money and funding. I read my book. I'd, I'd like people to start with my book and then re watch the drama because the drama, there are a lot of things that are not in the drama. But, and, and there were, I'm very close to everything. So there were a lot of, I had a, quite a lot of personal heartache about some of the things that weren't said and some things that were said that shouldn't have been said, in my opinion. But what it absolutely, I think it let the police off fairly easily and the CPS. But what I think it absolutely did was um, it educated the country on what grooming is. 100%. And, you know, I worked on that for four years. Um, you know, I, I was the programme consultant. I went out and brought every single person who's represented in that drama, bar one, um, was brought on board because I went and persuaded them to allow their story to be told. So I was kind of written out of it in, in, a, in a large, in a, in a way. But... It started, I now, when, when I talk now, um, I don't really have to explain grooming anymore. Explaining what grooming was, I do that. Now people understand it, but actually what has happened is that the, the victims of grooming are no longer blamed. You know, God help any police force that puts a 15-year-old victim of grooming on an indictment, speaking out. Everybody I spoke to within the police, within the CPS, within the criminal justice and tried to justify that. And it's unjustifiable to me. And it will never, there will never be a 14 year old kid who deserves to be added onto an indictment with 50 and 60 year old paedophiles. You know, it's like the law in relation to domestic violence now. You know, we now have, um, you know, coercive, controlling and coercive behavior because it's recognized. That the, that the bullying and that the fear, you know, even a 50-year-old woman is not equipped often to, um, to, to, to manage that or to resist it. What chance has a 14-year-old kid got? You know, and, and that somebody, a police officer or a lawyer, would even attempt to justify that fills me with horror. It, it absolutely disgusts me. And that's what keeps me going one voice I keep talking and every, every interview I do I say to people I mean I yes I have been paid to write my book but not a lot of money the, the blood sweat and tears that went into that they couldn't pay me for that but I felt it was the next part of the story that had to be told and what the drama's done it's played down a lot of the issues that I've raised I think in my book somebody reading it will 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 understand what brought me to this place but it's not finished. That is the start. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to use that as evidence to show what is still missing. Um, you know, I could have written, well, I, I potentially will write another book on what's happened since then. But I could only do so much in one book. But what I've learned since I left the police would make your toes curl. You know, it, it horrifies me. And that's why I can't... I'd like, you know, there are days... There are a lot of days, especially now, that I think, you know, why have you done this? You know, you've, you've spent the last seven years of your life where this has become my life. Um, the foundation is now going to become the next 10 years. Do, you, do I really want to do that? Yes, you do want to do all that. I know, but it's, it's a big responsibility. And I'm trying to juggle my own life around it a little I've got my you know obviously my own kids not a day goes by when I mean I, I think the key is to to try to bring into this now people who feel the same as me share the responsibility who have got the knowledge and expertise that I don't have so I'm not a psychotherapist I know what these kids need because you don't have to be a psychotherapist to understand that they need help sometimes it's just someone to listen to them other times it needs a lot more than that Sometimes it's a prosecution, but, you know, it needs somebody actually to know um, how to lead them through that process. I, you know, the reason I've used my name is not because I'm, you know, I want to see my name everywhere. It's just because it, it, it carries with it an explanation of what I'm trying to do without having to explain what the foundation is. I think if somebody who 
knows about safeguarding, who knows about abuse, here's my name. Well, I know because wherever I go, somebody sees Maggie Oliver, immediately it, it's the, um, it's the, what's the word? Not the logo. It's the, what I want my name to represent. Marks my name. But that itself, I think, I hope it will explain that, you know, it's about trust. It's about speaking the truth. It's about protecting kids. It's about providing a safe place. And it's actually about speaking out when you see something that mm -hmm. is not right. Trust your gut. Have the courage to speak out. I mean, I've just contributed where I've just been, well, I was asked a few months ago to contribute to another book, and I'm not going to say buy it, but it, yeah. is, it says how to make a difference. Um, and it, it, there's a part in here, um, there's been all, I mean, Bob Geldof's in there and Kofi Annan and they asked me if I'd, you know, contribute a, a section about, you know, speaking out really about how to make a difference and what, and, and how, what I would advise somebody else who was going to, who was considering kind of whistleblowing and, and I've kind of, I've said here what I said because I can't remember, but you know. I've said gather your facts so you can prove what you're saying. You know, uh, I'd say audio record every single official conversation you have so that you protect yourself. I didn't do that. And I'm trying to get documents now from Greater Manchester Police. They strangely say they've lost them. You know, and this is an official grievance procedure that I was, you know, we had a, a verbatim minute taker. They've not lost them. They just don't want to give them to me. Yeah. So, you know, going back, I would record it. I've been, well, I'm trying to highlight certain things with Andy Burnham, who's the mayor of Manchester. He's responsible for the police. But every meeting I have, I audio record. So I can prove what I'm saying. So that, you know, people who are going to speak out need to protect themselves. And I think, I, I do think we all have to, we have to try to be brave sometimes. And, want, you know, there are a lot of good people out there and sometimes it just takes one person to take the first step um I, but i just think it's important you know people we, i've had people like message me there's one one group of about 20 girls and they're going to do a sponsored climb of, of snowden in wales and so it's it's lots of little things to, um which initially will probably just be a drop-in center that coffee you know maybe mums and tots or coffee yeah. But then I believe, I'm led to believe, that we can then start to try to get some lottery funding and, um, you know, on Instagram and Twitter. That's it. I've got Facebook, but, I, you know, I don't, don't post on there all the time. But um, there's a, like, a, a, a well, two guys, actually. They're, they're following the journey and making a documentary. So we're just going to post it called, I think they, is it a, I think they called it a sizzler. <laughs> just all these little things. started a YouTube channel. So I'm not up on all those things. I, I can sort of. I can put a picture on Instagram, but that is a way of communicating with Thank you uh, for talking to us, Maggie. And uh, let's get this message out and let's try and stop and bring awareness of what's really going on in our communities and try and make our communities better for each and every one of us. I'm honoured that you've asked me and I hope that, you know, together we can make a big difference and change the things that still need to change because there's a lot needs doing still. You're very, very welcome.